Good morning, everybody. Uh, hopefully the sound works now. Um, I would like to welcome you to this very important session of the Nevada Public Health Echo Series. Uh, my name is John Lilly. I am the Regional Director for Donor Network West, uh, the Regional Director here in Nevada. Um, today I'm honored to talk to you about something that has personally affected my life which is the importance of organ, eye, and tissue donations for transplantation in our local community, the state of Nevada, and nationally. My goal today is to give you some general education of organ, eye, and tissue transplantation in the United States through the mechanism of the Organ Procurement Organization. I'm also gonna to speak to Nevada specifically regarding the community needs and what Donor Network West does to educate and promote donation, and then speak to how you can get involved in your company, your hospital, or where you work within your neighborhood, with your friends and family, to help those awaiting the gift of life and healing through donation. So let me briefly tell you my connection to donation is actually through my father. He is a double heart transplant recipient. Uh, my family's been really humbled and honored uh, by the gift of two donors, uh, and their families, which has given my father an additional 30 years of life. He turned 83 this year in April, and he and my mother are still doing very well, enjoying life, their children, their grandchildren, and even their great-grandchildren. So let me start today with a quick history of how organ donation started in the United States. And we're going to look at this through the lens of the legislation enacted and the institutions that grew and developed from those laws into what we have in place today. Fifty years ago, following the first successful U.S. heart transplant, Congress passed the Uniform Anatomical Gift Act. I'm going to call it the UAGA, which was the first legislation enacted by all states to address the donation of organs, tissues and eyes as gifts to someone who may be in need of these biological tissues for survival or medical therapy. It was drafted to increase organ tissue and blood donations along with providing a specific mechanism for protection of patients in the United States. It replaced numerous state laws concerning transplantation and laws that lacked a uniform procedure of organ donation along with an inadequate process of even becoming a donor. Multiple revisions have improved several important issues, including the opting in of donation to become a donor. And that's typically through the state registry when you sign up uh, at the DMV for your driver's license or identification card. Recent revisions also made it harder for next of kin to nullify one's wishes to authorize donation after their death. And then it's also outlined the specific hierarchy of those who can make the final decision for donation when a patient dies. When the National Organ Transplant Act, also known as NODA, was signed into law in 1984, it created the National Organ Procurement and Transplantation Network, OPTN, OPTN for matching organ donors, <clears throat> donors' organs to waiting recipients. The Organ Procurement Transplantation Network both standardized the process through which organs are donated and shared, uh, and that's across the country, created a system of federally designated organ procurement organizations. I'm going to call them periodically OPOs throughout the course of this presentation. Uh, these OPOs across the United States and its territories were formed through this act. The Organ Procurement and Transplantation Network includes all organ procurement organizations and the 256 transplant centers in the U.S. And it's managed under contract by the United Network for Organ Sharing, UNOS, located in Richmond, Virginia. So let's look at what an organ procurement organization is. They are not-for-profit and they represent a unique component of healthcare. By federal law, they are the only organizations that can perform the life-saving mission of recovering organs from deceased donors for transplantation. There are 58 organizations uh, in the United States, each responsible for organ procurement in their specific region. And as you can see from this map, it's not state-based, it's really patchworked across the United States for 
many particular reasons. All OPOs are regulated by multiple government agencies, such as the previously mentioned Organ Procurement and Transplantation Network, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS, Healthcare Resources and Services Administration, HRSA, and believe it or not, the US Food and Drug Administration. And all procurement agencies must adhere to the highest medical and ethical standards. Through collaboration and distribution of proven practices, organ procurement organizations excel in healthcare in the healthcare industry. OPOs utilize the newest scientific technology to facilitate medical advancements that place the hope of a life-saving transplant within reach for those awaiting the gift of life. I'm actually gonna talk a little bit here about the future and some of the scientific technology that's been expanded over the last few years to help transplantation later on in my presentation. So individual OPOs, organ procurement organizations, represent the front line of organ procurement, having direct contact with the hospital and the family of recently deceased donors. They're structured to include specific services, such as family support, but that family support is not just during the donation process, but after recovery through multiple uh, aftercare programs. We perform clinical management of the donor patient throughout the process and all the way through the end of the recovery of organs. We also are responsible for pro professional education, one thing I'm doing here today, uh, with our hospital partners and the public also to promote the importance and cause of donation. So let's break it down into what Donor Network West is. So we are one of the 58 organ procurement organizations in the country. We are the second largest agency by population and we serve well over 13 and a half million people, including the close to half a million people here in Washoe County and Carson City counties of Nevada. We partner with 175 hospitals through our region, 44 medical examiners and coroners, over 500 funeral homes, and most importantly, we work with some of the most successful transplant programs in the country, including University of California, San Francisco, California Pacific Medical Center, Stanford Healthcare, and Lucille Packard Children's Hospital at Stanford. These transplant centers last year were responsible for over 1,375 transplants of hearts, lungs, livers, kidneys, pancreas, and small intestines. As you can see, our, our region is very, very large and encompasses well over 100,000 square miles. So let's look a little closer into how Nevada supports donation. Nevada is a little bit unique in the fact that there are three organ procurement organizations within the state. You saw Donor Network West, uh, we're federally assigned to Washoe and Carson City counties. We also maintain agreements with several rural hospitals throughout Winnemucca, Hawthorne, Gardnerville, and Fallon, Nevada, and that's due to how close we are and a lot of their patients end up being transferred here to Reno uh, to our larger centers for a donation. Intermountain Donor Services, located in Salt Lake City, Utah, they serve 94 hospitals throughout Utah, Idaho, Wyoming, and Nevada. And as you can see up there in the northeast section of Nevada, they support uh, hospitals in Elko County. Um, and that's due to their location near the transplant center in Utah. Nevada Donor Network, located in Las Vegas, serves the remainder of Nevada and focuses the majority of their efforts within the Las Vegas and Henderson area. So most hospitals choose to partner with their assigned organ procurement organization to also facilitate tissue donations. Tissue and eye donation and recovery is a little different from organ as it's not a federally designated system and tissue recovery agencies can literally compete for hospital, coroner, and funeral home access to deceased patients. So as I previously mentioned, organ procurement organizations, we, we try and utilize cutting edge scientific technology and just good medical care to try and save as many lives as we can uh, to save those reaching, to reach those awaiting the gift of life. So how is the donation community, OPO community actually performing? So this slide actually shows 
how far we've come in such a really relative short amount of time in relation to modern medicine. So this data for donation goes back to 1990, and you can see just over 35 years. Last year, we had a total of 34,770 organ transplants performed. That marked the fifth consecutive year, record-setting year for transplants in the United States, and a record year of of close to 16,500 donors recovered. Also in 2017, a record number of donor organs were recovered and transplants occurred for each of the four most organs transplanted, kidneys, liver, heart, and lungs. Advances in medicine and technology and increased awareness of organ donation and transplantation has really contributed to a record number of transplants but the gap between supply and demand continues. The OPTN is working to ensure that all transplant candidates have a better chance to receive the gift of life. This shows the wait list since 1990 and beyond. According to the OPTN, there are currently over 114,500 people awaiting a life-saving organ transplant in the United States. The reality, every 10 minutes, someone's added to that national wait list. And every 22 minutes, somebody dies on that wait list. So what about transplants in Nevada? In 2017, 206 Nevadans received a life-saving organ transplant, the majority traveling out of state for their life-changing transplant. Every Nevadan in end-stage organ failure is transplanted in another state except for a small number of kidney recipients who are transplanted in Las Vegas. University Medical Center of Southern Nevada performs approximately 60 kidney transplants annually and is the only transplant center located within the borders of the state of Nevada. Patients have to seek transplants outside of Nevada with the majority going to our, the transplant centers within the San Francisco Bay Area, Southern California, and Arizona. Currently, the way allocation schemes are, there's a strategic benefit for recipients to be located within the same organ procurement organization service area as their affiliated transplant centers for access and priority to transplant. Currently, there are close to 600 Nevadans awaiting a transplant and close to 150 here in Carson City and Washoe counties. Last year, Donor Network West facilitated 307 organ donors, Intermountain Donor Services, 107 donors, and Nevada Donor Network, 123 donors. Let's dive down a little bit deeper and talk about the specific organs and tissues that can be recovered and transplanted. First off, the heart. The leading diseases that require a heart transplant are dilated cardiomyopathy, severe coronary artery disease that typically leads to heart attacks and scarring of, of heart tissue, along with birth defects. Currently, there are close to 3,900 patients on the national waiting list awaiting a life-saving heart transplant. Diseases that most commonly lead to the need for lung transplant are COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, pulmonary fibrosis, cystic fibrosis, and idiopathic pulmonary arterial hypertension. Right now, there are over 1,400 patients awaiting the opportunity to breathe freely again. Small intestine transplantation, although infrequent, can help patients who suffer from intestinal failure. These are typically children with short gut syndrome, along with victims of trauma or those suffering from severe Crohn's disease. There are currently 256 patients awaiting this form of transplant in the US. Pancreas transplants have actually decreased over the years due to the many factors, including improvements in diabetes care and management, and then changing donor and recipient conditions. There's still a number of patients transplanted with a solitary pancreas annually, which typically also may require a kidney transplant. There are clo close to 900 patients awaiting for a solitary pancreas transplant and almost double the number awaiting combination kidney pancreas. The liver's main job is to filter the blood coming from the digestive tract, detoxifying chemicals and metabolizing drugs. 
diseases such as hepatitis C, autoimmune liver disease, primary biliary cirrhosis, and alcoholic liver disease are the most common reasons for the need of a liver transplant. This vital organ system has close to 14,000 people <laughs> waiting for a transplant. And finally, with over 95,000 people awaiting a kidney transplant, due to the increasing incidence of hypertension and diabetes leading to chronic kidney disease, it is by far the most needed organ for transplant. So that's organ donation. Let's, let's dive a little deeper into human tissues that can be recovered to save and heal lives. Cornea transplantation is not a new procedure. The first transplants were performed in the late 1800s and the first eye bank actually established oh, more than 50 years ago. This procedure has been done routinely since the 1960s. And at present, there are over 44,000 cornea transplants done every year, making it the second most common transplant after blood. Keratoconus, which is progressive thinning of the cornea, cornea scarring from infections or injury, um, or progressive diseases like oops dystrophy, uh, which causes cloudiness of the cornea are the typical means of needing a cornea transplant. Uh, there are many reasons for needing a heart valve or repair. Things like calcified uh, valve stenosis, insufficiency from rheumatic heart disease, uh, failure of a previous allograft valve or infection of that valve, abnormalities and um, hyperplastic left heart syndrome leads to the need for a replacement or repair of a defective heart valve. The typical heart valve that is replaced is the aortic valve being the most common and the mitral valve is the most common that needs to be repaired. Only rarely are the tricuspid and pulmonic valves repaired or replaced. Over 106,000 heart valve procedures occur each year uh, to repair or replace diseases. And you have two mechanisms. You can have a mechanical, which is a man-made uh, heart valve, typically made of stainless steel or titanium or even ceramic. So these valves last the longest, um, but during the course of having that heart valve, the patient will need to remain on blood thinning medication like Coumadin or aspirin for the remainder of your life, which has an increase of higher incidence of intracranial hemorrhage leading disorders. If you receive a biological heart valve from a human cadaveric valve or even animal tissue, these valves don't quite last as long, typically 12 to 15 years, but you may not need to take those blood thinners leading to a higher quality of um, so we do have a question here. Yeah. Um, I thought cirrhosis from alcohol or other organ damage from alcohol disqualified you from getting on the list for organ transplant. That is actually a great question. So it does not preclude you from being listed for transplant. Uh, transplant centers, when you are worked up for your particular transplant, will require you to become alcohol and drug free um, so that they know when you get that transplant, you will hopefully take care of that transplant. So no, alcoholic liver cirrhosis does not preclude you from being offered the opportunity to receive a do uh, donor liver. Great question. Skin grafts are used for many purposes, predominantly used for extensive wounds, trauma, burns, areas of skin loss due to infections, such as necrotizing fasciitis, um, or specific surgeries, surgeries requiring skin grafts for healing specifically removal for skin from skin cancers. So I'm really happy that I get to present this information uh, in the month of October, which is uh, Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And if you don't know, next Wednesday, October 17th is Bra Day. For those of you who don't know what Bra Day is, it's Breast Reconstruction Awareness Day. And here in Reno, we have partnered with Bebo Coffee, which has four different locations throughout our area. And if you go into Bebo's that day and ask for their bra day uh, coffee, you get a special bra day cookie to go along with that to promote uh, breast cancer reconstruction. So what most people aren't aware of is a large portion of skin and tissue used for breast reconstruction actually comes from cadaveric tissue and skin. 
The gift of bone and connective tissues helps individuals with various orthopedic and neurological conditions. Tissue includes tendons, ligaments, and cartilage that will be used in a variety of back, joint, leg surgeries, such as hip replacements, knee re reconstruction, and spinal fusions. So after a bone recovery, uh, bone and soft tissue recovered, trained professionals replace that bone with prosthetics for funeral viewing arrangements. So just on a personal note, my father is a heart transplant recipient. Also my daughter who played soccer all the way through high school on varsity soccer, she sustained a complete tear of her ACL and towards the end of her career in high school. We were offered the opportunity to use a cadaveric ligament or use her own hamstring as an allograft. We decided on using her hamstring, which required a longer recovery time as she had to rehabilitate both her knee and her hamstring. Um, that was a really tough decision for us, but the opportunity to heal her knee with a donor ligament was a strong consideration that we had to take into, take into fact if she was thinking about trying to play soccer in college. So right now there are is well over 5.3 million orthopedic surgeries performed annually in the United States. And a large majority of these are using cadaveric tissue, bones, tendons, and cartilages. The last on here is arteries and veins, which as you know, arteries carry oxygenated blood from the heart to the rest of the body and veins bring that deoxygenated blood back to the heart. So many people lose circulation in their legs or even their heart due to disease or trauma. Donated veins and arteries are used to restore circulation through heart bypass surgeries and to avoid leg amputations for people suffering from poor circulation. So there are nearly 500,000 coronary artery bypass graft surgeries performed each year in the US. It's one of the nation's most common major operations. Arteries such as the mammary and thoracic uh, and radial arteries in the arm uh, are used along with the large vein in the leg called the saphenous vein are used for these procedures. Any other questions here? Yeah. So I must say donation is not really well reflected in many of the Hollywood shows and movies that you may have seen or, or, or viewed. It's very remarkable and a well-developed pathway that I think it's very important to understand. Donor Network West and most organ procurement organizations have this pathway and similar job functions to ensure that the opportunity to donate is identified and offered to all patients and their families when appropriate. So first comes development. Our community development liaison works hard, hand in hand with many regional and state parties uh, and partners to promote the cause of donation. One of the most important aspects of what these valuable team members do is asking people to make their decision about donation by signing up on the Nevada or their state registry, making their wishes known to their family. I'll actually cover some of the events and partnerships we have in just a few minutes. We have multiple staff that do hospital development. The work is tirelessly to educate all of our hospitals, coroners, medical examiners and funeral homes about donation. Most important to this is the identification of patients who are potential donors and contacting Donor Network West so that we can mobilize staff as early as possible. They not only help educate, they assist the hospitals with donation policies and procedures, provide key metrics for quality performance, build and maintain key relationships with leadership and medical professionals. I must say, these are the boots on the ground and they're so ingrained and thought of as part of our healthcare team through our strong work through this hospital development staff. So it's mandatory through federal regulations for hospitals to identify and call in referrals to their affiliated organ procurement organizations. These referrals are for patients that meet strict clinical cues, such as having a significant neurological injury, uh, be on a vent or a family is discussing redirection of care towards comfort measures or withdrawing life-sustaining treatments. When that call comes into Donor Network West, we make an initial screening to see about <clears throat> uh, suitability. As many patients due to their medical history, organ failure, or a multitude of other factors may rule themselves out for the option of becoming an organ donor. 
After initial screening, if the patient appears to be a suitable candidate, clinical staff come to the hospital to perform further chart reviews, looking at a multitude of medical factors such as lab values, the mechanism of injury, diagnostic testings like CT scans, echocardiograms, x-rays, and mechanical ventilation support. If the patient is still a suitable candidate, we work uh, at, with a collaborative plan with the entire medical team to develop and ensure that the option of donation is maintained. So probably one of the most vital and important pieces of this pathway outside of identifying the referral is providing family support through their grief and loss. This starts with the professionals at the hospital, so by physicians giving all pertinent information on a diagnosis, support of the nursing staff who provides care at the bedside, social services who facilitate support and, informa and information, and also spiritual services. So every piece of that is vital to family support. When the appropriate, uh, excuse me, when appropriate through collaboration and frequent huddles, a plan is made to offer, again, at the appropriate time, the option of donation. Multiple studies show that a collaborative approach with the hospital and procurement staff is the most effective in providing information and support. Whether through a planned discussion to ask the family to authorize for donation or to update a family that a patient's wishes were already known as a registered donor, family support is the same. Donor Network West has a team of family resource coordinators and regional donation coordinators who speak with families almost every day and are specifically trained in answering the many questions that arise. Hopefully a family authorizes or a patient is identified on the registry to allow donation to move forward. So following an authorization, a lengthy medical and social history questionnaire is reviewed with the family and friends as pertinent. For those of you who have donated blood, it is very similar to that medical and social history, just a lot longer. <laughs> so once authorization and medical social history is obtained, donor management and workup begins. Depending upon many factors, the medical suitability of each organ is determined uh, and testing performed. We require frequent labs, blood gases, x-rays to evaluate each organ, and then can perform specialized testing like bronchoscopies to evaluate the lungs, echocardiograms to look at the function of the heart, cardiac catheterization to look at potential coronary artery disease, and CT imaging to look at the anatomy of organs and diagnose unusual findings. Is there another question? Uh, we'll get through that again. So during the course of our workup, clearance for donation is obtained on every patient to ensure from our coroner and medical examiners to ensure that donation does not preclude any investigation. Very seldom do our, our medical examiners and coroners decline the option of donation as we maintain really strong relationships and provide large amounts of clinical information during the course of our workup. I personally would like to acknowledge Dr. Knight from Washoe County Medical Examiner, uh, whose team are very, very strong advocates for donation in Northern Nevada and literally throughout the state. Once donor workup is complete and the medical examiner has given us permission, Donor Network West staff allocate organs following strict national guidelines. All transplantable organs are offered until they have a recipient identified. The list is exhausted or due to distance, the organ is not viable for transplant. A recovery time is booked and transplant recovery teams actually come to that donor hospital for the recovery. Tissue recovery follows in the operating room or at the coroner's office, depending upon the needs of the investigation. Our clinical teams maintain management of the patient throughout the entire process and are with the patient throughout the entire process. We perform multiple internal and external reviews to ensure quality of following this pathway and correcting any deficits or quality measures not met. So I must say for most families, donation is a positive perspective of the life-saving act of donation. It was perceived as an opportunity to live on and provide a meaning of, and sense to comfort families. That life-saving act of donation can provide a positive effect to, to grieving families. 
tons of studies have shown donation is a good thing for the grieving process for the vast majority of patients who say yes to donation. Okay, so we do have a couple of questions here. One of them goes back to the slide about what can't be donated. Um, so how do they remove uh, veins and arteries without them being destroyed? Our tissue recovery staff are extremely well trained to do the recovery of bones, cornea, ligaments, tendons, veins, arteries, and uh, there is a very unique process and very well trained staff. Um, a little bit too in depth for this presentation, but if you contact me, I can put you in contact with one of our tissue recovery staff who can walk you through that process. And then I see how many organs are usually recovered from one person. It depends upon the patient. So from a elderly 70 year old, typically it's liver and kidneys. Um, from a young patient, it could be up to eight lives saved. Um, and that's heart, liver, kidneys too, lungs too, um, pancreas, small intestine. And the unique thing about the liver is if you remember from anatomy, it actually has two lobes and at times we can actually recover that organ, split it and help two patients. So again, it depends upon that patient's past medical history, age, a whole lot of different criteria to determine how many organs will be recovered from that patient or transplant. Great questions. Um, and one other question, how long do you have to get an organ to, to the individual, yeah, from harvest to uh, getting the transplant done? So from recovery until transplant, again, it's dependent upon the organ system. Kidneys can stay outside of the body and travel literally across the country to the best matched patient usually up to about 30 hours from the time of recovery to transplant. The liver and pancreas is around 12 hours from recovery to transplant. And the thoracic organs, hearts and lungs, typically need to be transplanted within four to six hours. And remember I said allocation, if we are reaching all the way out to the East Coast and we are transplanted, we have a donor hospital here in Reno, the chances for a thoracic team to fly from Duke or New York fly to Nevada, recover that organ, and transplant it within four to six hours is very narrow. We have done it, and we have done it for a lot of different patients, but the chances of that happening are very low. Uh, so a lot of questions come in here. Thanks, everyone. Um, are there a lot of organs that miss the time frame? Uh, no. No, actually. We call it discard rates. Um, and when an when a organ is not able to be utilized and is accepted by a transplant center, they have to come up with the reason why it was not transplanted. And very seldom do we not hit those time frames. Okay. Um, what's the rate of patients rejecting organs that have been donated? Well, very, very low. And I can speak from my personal experience with my father. Uh, two heart transplants, uh, one in 1988, one in 1995, and he is still alive and with us today. The the Transplant centers are actually evaluated for their, their one month, one year, and three year outcomes to determine, and they have to meet certain standards that uh, transplantation is actually becoming a norm, especially kidney transplantation as part of a normal uh, medical diagnosis and workup. So the initial uh, rejection is very, very low. Okay. Um, what percentage of organ donors end up having their organs actually used in transplant? Of deceased organ donors. So I believe the numbers are somewhere like 2.5, 2.6 million deaths in the United States alone. Less than 1% of those patients' deaths actually turn into organ donors. Um, and that's due to the very narrow reach, the very narrow uh, diagnosis that has to be determined. And we'll actually talk about it here in a few slides of how to become an organ donor. Um, is there somewhere online where we can go to determine who can be listed as donors, such as past history of cancer, et cetera? I will actually give you our website at the end of the presentation, which has great information and links to multiple areas. Um, what we tell people is don't rule yourself out. Um, that We can still recover patients who have had a past history of cancer. Um, I will talk about research here in a, in a minute. Um, I've been doing this for 17 years, and what was ruled out in 2001 when I started this to now, and now what we're recovering and transplanting is extremely different. All right, um, and for people who have a transplant that goes awry, do they get sent back to the bottom of the list, or do they take priority to fix the problem? That's a great question. 
in the um, most of them can be relisted. Uh, the majority of heart, lungs, and livers, you get listed on how sick you are. So if you have a, a transplant that does not do well, you can get relisted, and depending upon how sick you are, is how you go on that, how how where you are on the the national wait list. Along with that is kidneys. You usually wait for for wait time. Um, kidneys are a little different that if you reject your kidney, I believe the system is that you can maintain your wait time so that you have access, especially for a kidney failure. Okay. And speaking about rejection, I've heard that there are medications that are used to help prevent the body from rejecting organs. Does that have any effect on uh, the body system as a whole? Yes. Uh, most transplant recipients, well not most, the, the vast majority will be on immunosuppressive drugs for the remainder of their lives. Different dosages depending upon how well that organ is functioning with that body. Um, it does have an effect on other systems. Uh, it makes you more susceptible to cancer, to other uh, infectious disease processes by lowering your immune system. So great question. Uh, and one last question here, then we'll go back to the slides. Um, if someone is awaiting an organ, what things can disqualify them from receiving one? Disqualify them. So there's not a lot that will disqualify them. I did talk about a lot of transplant centers require their, their recipients to be drug and alcohol free. Um, I don't have all of the, the answers for disqualification for receiving an organ. That's more on the transplant center side. But again, uh, my contact information is at the end of the slide presentation. And let me follow up with whoever answered that. You can shoot me a quick email. Thanks. All right. Wow. That was a flurry question. <laughs> okay. So one thing that we also do uh, when organs and tissues can't be used for transplantation, the opportunity to participate in clinical tri trials and research aimed at improving donation and transplantation, along with research in diseases for diabetes, heart disease, and many others, allow a donor to affect every human in the United States and literally across the world. We work with a lot of different research institutions, such as UCSF Medical Center, uh, San Francisco, Vanderbilt, Stanford, Johns Hopkins, and the University of Texas. There's numerous studies we participate in, but I really wanted to focus on several cutting edge and exciting ones. The first being Transmedics, uh, and several other companies are doing this with warm perfusion systems. As you've probably seen right now, we recover organs and they go into cold storage. They are flushed with cold preservation solutions stored in sterile ice and shipped off to be transplanted. So by simulating the conditions of the human body by this warm perfusion system, it keeps lungs breathing, the heart beating, and livers producing bile, all while they're tra transported to save the life of a patient. The benefits of the system are threefold. It increases the time an organ can be viable outside of the body. We already talked about those transport times. It enables the assessment of the organ functioning outside of the body, and it allows for a resuscitation of the organ. So more time and more knowledge means that more organs could reach more patients in better condition. We also work with a group, a company called Anabios, and we're recovering the dorsal root ganglia from the spinal column, which are being cultured and used to investigate the cellular and molecular mechanisms involved in pain, itch, nerve injury and regeneration. So as we know, a focus on the opioid crisis in the US, if you think about that research and about using different drugs or therapies on, to manage pain rather than using highly addictive opioids is a huge piece of research that we're in, in, ingrained in. This is really neat too. You know, 100 billion neurons, 100 trillion connections in the human brain. It's one of the most mysterious uh, organs in science, uh, greatest challenges in medicine. So all the neurological and psychiatric disorders such as Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, autism, epilepsy, schizophrenia, depression, traumatic brain injury, these all extract a tremendous toll on individuals, their families, and the society at large. The only way we can study the mechanism behind these disorders is to directly study the human brain. So during the last several years, Donated brain tissues have played a critical role in discoveries related to the, these number of human brain disorders. So Donor Network West, we've 
currently started working with Stanford University to extract human brains from donors for research and hopefully therapies and cure development for these medical issues um, can be uh, derived from this research. The last I'd like to talk about is really exciting and this goes to the question that somebody had about who cannot be a recipient. So the HOPE Act was actually uh, put into legislation in 1995, or excuse me, 2015. And the HOPE Act is the HIV Organ Policy Equity Act. It allows people living with HIV to register and save lives as organ donors to people living with HIV on transplant wait lists. So the HOPE and Action Team is based at Johns Hopkins. Uh, the, it's the Epidemiology Research Group and Organ Transplantation. The CDC estimates that there's 1.1 million Americans living with HIV, and the HOPE Act allows those HIV positive patients to hopefully transplant other patients, and more transplants equals more lives saved. So this goes into another one of the questions is, uh, what, who can be a donor? So there's actually three types of donation. I think it's really important to understand the different arms and pathways to that. The first and the majority of our organ donors in the United States are clinically diagnosed as brain dead. This is where a person no longer has blood going to or activity in their brain to a severe, from a severe brain injury. They are permanently lost, the potential for consciousness and the capability to breathe. This may happen even when a ventilator is keeping that person's heart beating and oxygenating is circulating through their blood. So brain death is not the same as a coma. Person in a coma is unconscious because their brain is injured in some way. In a coma, the brain continues to function and may heal. With brain death, however, there is no possibility of recovery as the brain has ceased to function and cannot recover. For brain death, a series of tests are carried out by in Nevada, one independent physician, and in other states, two independent and appropriately qualified doctors from the hospital to determine death. Approximately 86% of our um, donors at Donor Network West are brain dead, meet brain death criteria. The second type of donor is called donation after circulatory death, or I'm going to call it DCD donation. It's the irreversible loss of function of circulation after cardiac arrest. So it can be planned, the planned withdrawal of life-sustaining treatment from a patient within the intensive care unit or emergency department. This withdrawal of care happens in every hospital throughout the United States almost every day. But for circulatory death donation, we monitor that patient closely when a family is authorized and donation will only proceed once circulation has ceased. Timeframes for recovery of these are very short, typically within 60 minutes from the time that the patient is redirected to comfort measures and the ventilator support is withdrawn. Um, and that's due to the fact that organs can't be viable for long periods of time without box oxygen and um, blood, -rich, blood rich oxygen and nutrients. So both brain death and donation after circulatory death donations are all facilitated by the organ procurement organizations. The last pathway is actually living donation. So you can still be alive and choose to donate a kidney, a small section of your liver, or even discarded bone from a hip or knee replacement. In the United States, we have paired kidney exchange programs that help people who need a kidney transplant, but may not have a compatible live donor to help them. Becoming more popular are living kidney chains, which literally provides patients across the country who is not a match for their friends or families to receive for someone else who is a match for their family or friend. So this is, it's a little blurry, but if you see up at the upper left, there's that donor who gives to recipient one and their friend in black above them gives to recipient two and their friend above them gives to recipient three until the chain is closed and that first donor receives their transplant. Very, very unique process and a great way to affect those 95,000 patients waiting on a kidney transplant. So living donation for kidneys and livers, those are not facilitated by our organization or organ procurement organizations. Those workups are performed at the transplant centers. Um, so question going back to the uh, 
transplant program for uh, people who are HIV positive. Yes. Do the donors have to have uh, suppressed viral loads to donate? Yes, very good question. And we, so HIV is a very manageable disease process and the HIV donors that we have recovered are very, I will call them healthy. They have low viral loads and we do uh, specific testing to determine their, their T, T counts and uh, all of their viral load studies. So typically, yes, they have to be those healthy HIV patients. If they have other comorbidities like hepatitis C or uh, other disease processes, it makes it a little bit more difficult for those recipients receiving those transplants. Um, do you have a rate of HIV transmission for your transplants? It is extremely low. Um, part of our workup, and I had it in the donor pathway slide, is that we, we do serological testing on every single one of our organ, eye, and tissue donors. And through the technology of, of serological testing, specifically nucleic acid testing, which tests the RNA processes of HIV and hepatitis, we have dramatically lowered the window of being able to identify patients who are seroconverted or have been exposed to HIV and HCV. The transmission is extremely low, very, very low. Okay. Um, I believe you already answered this. Can you still donate skin? Uh, their grandfather did that as well as bone marrow. Yes. Uh, from HIV patients? Oh, is no, that the just question? In, just in general? general? Yeah. yeah, we actually had an 83-year-old tissue uh, donor here, in, and it was a skin donor. And the thing about older, um, our older death population is that their skin is a lot more elastic and actually uh, works well for grafts. So again, I tell people, do not rule yourself out as potential donors. Great questions. So wow, uh, I've talked a lot of information in a very, very short amount of time, answered a lot of question, questions, but what I'd like to focus on in the next few minutes is our fantastic partnerships and activities that we do annually and periodically to promote donation. Then I'm gonna challenge you, whatever hospital, company, university program, organization that you work for or represent, how can you partner together to try and save and heal as many lives as we can in partnering with Donor Network West and your local organ procurement organizations. So a couple of things we've done this year is we worked with the city of Reno and an amazing company called uh, Have Lights Will Travel, uh, who donated their time and lights to light up our belief sign in the city plaza in the donation colors of blue and green. We were really fortunate to have Mayor Sheevy, the mayor of Reno, uh, who is a kidney recipient herself, join us uh, and promote this, along with the Reno Fire Department. So I'm really happy to be doing this for the University of Nevada today, School of Medicine, but we also have really strong relationships and partners with the Orvis School of Nursing. And our relationship with the University of Nevada here in Reno is, is growing. So we partnered with the School of Nursing during their community health semester rotations to educate these future nurses of our state on the importance of donation. So this group here is a group of nine students who came together for a project of promoting donation during our, our recent Great Reno Balloon Races. And they successfully went around and got 50 people to sign up on the registry, which was a great feat. So our Great Reno Balloon Race, which has a Donate Life Balloon, is also a great discussion piece for that entire three-day event to promote donation. In the entire state, um, a huge win for organ and tissue donation was in 2016. Governor Brian Sandoval signed SB 112, which was a bill promoted by Senator Raddy, Rad, Raddy and Senator Keith Keffer. Um, he signed it into law, and it requires Nevada high schools to provide organ and tissue donation information in education programming. Organizations in the state are responsible within their regions to ensure that this education occurs and follows guidelines outlined in the legislation. And then one thing I'm really proud of, Donate Life Nevada is a collaboration of the agencies responsible for organized tissue donation here in the state of Nevada. So, Nevada Donor Network in Las Vegas, Donor Network West here in Northern Nevada, Sierra Donor Services, who's a tissue recovery agency, and Intermountain Donor Services, who services Alco, 
we're, we're all proud affiliates of Don Donate Life America, which is a not-for-profit alliance committed to motivating the American public to register now as an organ, eye, and tissue donor. So our mission here in Nevada is to save lives by educating and inspiring people to become an organ, eye, and tissue donor through signing up on the Nevada Registry. Um, question, could you talk a little bit about the uh, organ donation indicator on the driver's license? Yeah, absolutely. So when you go to the Department of Motor Vehicles, 99% of people, when they sign up on the registry, they do it through the Department of Motor Vehicles, which puts that little heart onto your driver's license or identification card. And that check mark actually puts you on the Nevada registry. The organ procurement organization that serves your area, your state, has access to that registry. So when we get that referral for a potential patient at the hospital, the first thing we do is check that registry to ensure if that patient has made their wishes known. That's whether we move forward with donation or not. It's very valuable for us to know that patient's uh, wishes upon their death. So the other method, and I will leave you the websites, is to sign up on the registry online. Um, and it's a little bit more intensive in the fact that you can sign up and register for the organs and tissues that you're willing to transplant. When you sign up at the registry at the DMV, it's kind of a blanket authorization that allows you to, or all organs, eyes, tissues, and research. When you sign up online, it allows you to be a little bit more selective about that. Did that answer your question? I think that's great. Yeah, great. So we also have some high media representation and impact things that we do. Um, recently, our uh, Team Nevada participated in the Transplant Games in Salt Lake City, Utah. Transplant Games are a multi-sport festival event produced by Transplant Life Foundation. For individuals who have undergone life-saving transplant surgeries, the competition events are open to living donors, organ transplant recipients, bone marrow, corneal, and tissue transplant recipients. It's more than an athletic event. The, the Donate Life Transplant Games highlight the critical importance of organ eye and tissue donations and then celebrate the lives of organ donors and recipients. I can um, get to that last one. Okay, yeah. So Northern Nevada also has a huge donor walk annually, typically in the month of September. Um, this past September 16th was one of the largest as hundreds of people joined at the Sparks Marina for the donor walk, honoring donors for, from our local community. And then here are the many thank yous from those who have benefited from the amazing gift of transplantation. And then probably one of the most notable national initiatives is the annual Donate Life Rose Parade float. Since 2004, organ procurement agencies and transplant centers have come together to promote and educate the nation and world about the importance of organ, eye, and tissue donation. In 2019, the theme of the float is the rhythm of the heart, and will honor donors who have saved lives through fluorographs on the float. There's gonna be 43 fluorographs. And if you don't know, there's well over 700,000 spectators who crowd into Pasadena to see the Rose Parade. And this is by far one of the most favorite floats. And then the Rose Parade is seen by over 63 million people around the world. So think about the impact that this one float has on donation. So we're really honored that one of those 43 fluorographs this year is going to be from one of our donors here in Northern Nevada. Um, she was a young student at the University of Nevada, Reno, and she wanted to be a physician. Unfortunately, she suffered an anoxic event after a severe asthma attack and she made her wishes known uh, that upon her death, she wanted to be an organ eye and tissue donation. She saved three lives through organ donation and healed many, many more through the gifts of her tissue donation. So here's my challenge to you. What can you do to support those awaiting a life-saving or healing transplant? The first thing I want you to do is make up your mind about donation. And if you choose to be a donor, sign up on the Nevada Registry and let your loved one know. You can register here at these websites. This presentation will actually be posted on the ECHO site through the University of Nevada School of Medicine. Um, and there's also a national registry, and you can sign up on the national registry at registerme.org. Get involved. Get involved with us. 
Get involved with Donor Network West or your regional organ procurement organization. We have an amazing team of donation ambassadors and they donate their time, go throughout the communities to talk about their experiences with donation. This is only a small part of them. They present at high schools, colleges, local companies, community engagement opportunities, and anywhere we can get them in front of. Is there any opportunity for us to come and speak to you or your group? So in closing, and I know we have a couple of questions, in closing, I, I hope this was useful and educational on how organ procurement organizations and specifically Donor Network West helps those awaiting the gift of life and healing through the remarkable medical technology and transplantation. I've been in this field for 17 years and I'm proud of the work that we do every day. It's definitely hard and emotional work, but the mission is very strong and noble. And as you can see, Donor Network West, we have a, a heart for Nevada, we have a heart for our donor families, and a heart for our community partners. So uh, that is the end of my presentation. I think there's a couple more questions. Yep. I think one was on funding, right? Um, so yeah, if a donor is responsible for uh, paying the medical costs and that type of thing. So upon authorization, upon their declaration of brain death and authorization from the family, the organ procurement organization takes over all full billing for the workup of that donation process. Now, prior to our involvement, their insurance company or that family is still responsible for that, that piece of their hospitalization, but we take over all of that billing for the donor workup. And that is everything from labs to x-rays to all of that. And a lot of the questions then go to, well, how do we get funded as a not-for-profit? We're very similar to a not-for-profit hospital. Um, our reimbursement comes through acquisition charges from the transplant centers receiving the organs. So those are typically uh, paid for through recipient insurance and Medicare. So charges and payments are based on costs of recovering those organ transplants. Uh, a lot of tissues, tissues are a little different. We are reimbursed through tissue processors who use those tissues and charge hospitals for the use of those tissues and then we are reimbursed for those. Hopefully that answered that question. Um, does the same apply to live donors? Living donation, uh, again, not in my wheelhouse. That's a transplant center specific, but I believe that there, because it's such a cost savings for a kidney recipient to be off dialysis, most insurance companies will cover the cost of that, that workup for living donation on both sides. Um, and I think you already addressed this as well. When signing up to donate, you can, spe you can specify which organs you would like to donate. Yes, again, uh, when you sign up on the registry at the Department of Motor Vehicles, it is a blanket for all organs, tissues, and research. But when you go online, you can actually update your registry, and you can sign up online also and make your specific organs that you, you can be a lot more selective and select the organs, tissues, and research that you're willing to participate or not participate. Okay. And would that online portion then, would they look at that first over your driver's license, giving that blanket? No, so, so the registry is the registry. So whether you sign up online or at the Department of Motor Vehicles, once a patient is identified at the hospital, we get involved. We look at one specific registry in the state of Nevada. Because of where we're located here, we also have access to the California registry, and we also check the national registry. Um, if we find that a patient is from out of state, say you're visiting here to gamble in Reno, or to ski in, Reno, in Tahoe from Michigan or wherever, and you have an accident, we can contact that organ procurement organization in the state that they represent and have them check the registry. Okay. So is the registry basically like the ultimate, you know, that overrides anything that is, below that? Okay. It, it does. Um, and... One thing to recognize from the registry, and I talked about it from the legislation, is we are, all hospitals and especially organ procurement organizations, we are about patient autonomy. When somebody makes that decision to be an organ, eye, and tissue donation, it's up to my team and our staff to honor that, that commitment and honor that desire to be uh, a donor at the end of their life. And hospitals want to honor that also. And we work very closely with families who a lot of times don't know their loved one is registered. That's why I always say, make your decision about donation and let your loved ones know what your decision is, whether yes or no. It makes it a lot easier when these situations happen. Thanks. Yeah.
Um, any other questions? I think we're just about out of time. Feel free to write them in uh, in the chat or the Q&A function. And my contact information is at the end of the presentation, along with my email and cell phone number. Please, please feel free to reach out and ask any questions. And again, my challenge to you, is there anything that we can partner with you to educate our Nevada communities about organized tissue donation? Excellent. All right, thank you, John. Thank you, everyone, for participating today. Thanks for all the questions. Uh, this was awesome. Thanks. Thank you.